AI is rapidly changing the way we live and work and um, makes sense at this point in time for us to start having discussions on how it's going to impact the remediation industry. You've probably started using some AI, um, maybe chat GPT, or maybe you know of people who have or work colleagues who have. I know in my office, our marketing manager uses all the time to develop some original, some initial content to then modify a good starting point. But I think you all are familiar in our remediation industry and in civil environmental engineering. A lot of times, so new software technology, we can be a little slower to adapt, and that's because a lot of our work is public projects. We have a lot of stakeholder, invi um, stakeholder involvement, um, and much of what we do requires physical equipment out in the field or hardware, which is usually a bit slower to adapt um, and develop than software technology. Um, and then obviously, we also have a lot of concerns with some of our projects on data confidentiality which is something else that I'm sure you've seen a lot in the news and discussions about AI technologies. So in our world, many times we revert to the tried and true approach uh, because there's a lot of certainty in that and our clients like certainty, regulators like certainty, public like certainty. But as we've seen in our careers, we evolve um, and we're gonna have to evolve to this new technology and figure out how it fits within remediation and because it's gonna become commonplace in our day-to-day -day work. These are three thought leaders, Pacific Northwest and AI, very diverse backgrounds. None of them do remediation work, um, but I think they bring a really neat perspe unique perspective to us and to you all. Um, so as they're talking, think about how what they're, you know, the ideas that they have and how that applies to your projects, because we certainly want to have some good questions at the end from you all on how this actually influences remediation. With that, I'll go ahead and introduce the panelists briefly. Um, first, we've got Dylan Adams here. He's a patent attorney with Davis Wright Tremaine. Dylan specializes in helping companies protect their ideas and inventions, including but not limited to AI, robotics, software, and computer hardware. He's, in addition to his law degree, he's got a master's in electrical engineering, and he's also the author of the book Patents Demystified, which provides inventors, startups, and entrepreneurs an insider's guide to the patent process. Next, we have Professor Ling Zin Wu. Um, she's an assist, uh, assistant professor at, in the Department of Construction Management at UW. She's also an adjunct professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Alberta. She's also a licensed engineer, professional engineer in Canada, and her work focuses on um, advancing digital transformation in construction. And then lastly, we've got Dan Pancani. He's a se senior engineer at Geocentech with 20 years of experience in hydrologic and hydro hydraulic analysis, software development, and workflow automation for envi environmental data management. He holds degrees in both civil engineering and software engineering. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. He's gonna give his uh, presentation first, and then uh, Ling Zi will go next, followed by Dylan. So uh, for the next seven minutes, I'm, I'm going to set the stage by defining what AI is. But before we do that, um, I have here a sheet of paper in my hands. Who knows how many times I can fold this over on itself? Good, that is very close. <laughs> and towards the end of my seven minutes, I'll tell you why that is important. Um, in the meantime, imagine that when you were born, you were given a sheet of paper, and on every birthday, you fold it. Try to guess how thick it will be on your 30th birthday. So artificial intelligence, what does it mean? I um, looked around for a simple definition. It's basically um, computers doing things we consider intelligent. There are several branches, and actually branches are a bit of a misnomer because underneath the AI umbrella, there are just different areas that are now beginning to overlap a lot because the underlying technology is neural networks and all these different areas of um, AI are using neural networks to solve problems in different ways. Obviously, we're not going to be able to talk about all of them, but you're probably already familiar with machine learning. You've heard generative AI, which is what uh, ChatGPT is known for. Uh, natural language processing, You. You've probably heard of robotics, computer vision, self-driving cars, and all of that. So focusing in on um, just machine learning and generative AI, machine learning tries to look at your existing data to try to predict trends. 
And generative AI is actually a subset of machine learning. All of these are using the exact same neural networks and it tries to predict your next sentence or your next word. And then we have natural language processing, which is also very related to generative AI, which uh, tries to make sense of our, our words and our speech. Again, underneath all of these are neural networks, and I'm not going to bore you with a def um, uh, technical definition of what neural networks are, but think about this from a programmer's perspective. If I want to tell a computer to do something that I know how to do, I can give it a series of if-then-else statements, and it can do it. But if I need to tell a computer to do something that I don't know what to do, that's where neural networks come in. So for instance, I've never played the game Go. If somebody gave me a million dollars to program a computer that can play Go, I cannot use a series of if-then-else statements to, teach the, to tell the computer how to do it. But I can show it a bunch of Go games that have been played well and ask it to figure out a model that it can put those games or similar games into and get winning games on the outside. So in a nutshell, this is what neural networks represent. For the first time, we now have a way to teach computers to do things that we ourselves either do not know how to do or will be tedious to tell the computer how to do explicitly. Think of translating every human voice. Even if you knew how to do it in a step-by-step -step fashion, it will be onerous to do that for every voice. And neural networks do this for us. So hopefully this gives you an idea of um, what AI is. In terms of remediation, there is a spectrum of, of applications for AI that are happening today in terms of what uh, you can do. And, and there are a few more coming that are even more exciting. So computer vision has not had its chat GPT moment yet, but it promises a lot of um, improvements in the way we work and, and a lot of disruption when that happens. So think of self-driving cars, for instance. Self-driving cars are going to have to be able to recognize human actions. So human action recognition is going to be a huge part of that. And if those models are made available, engineers like us can take those uh, models and fine tune them to recognize actions that you would do on a remediation, in a remediation environment. So for instance, you can have an AI agent watching a person sampling according to a certain protocol and advise that human uh, field tech person when they are missing steps or when they're doing something wrong. You can have AI watching an entire site and alerting people when there are safety concerns. So anyway, so real quick, um, today you can use ChatGPT to generate reports. That is no secret. You can paste in a whole uh, article and it will summarize it for you in three points. It can perform sentiment analysis on your report and tell you the tone. Uh, 2D, 3D visualizations can be generated automatically. So for instance, uh, Microsoft is integrating AI into um, Office 365, and simply by opening a spreadsheet of data, Excel can suggest different types of charts and trends automatically without you having to do anything that might provide insights. So I'll leave it there and uh, we'll pass it on to um, Lindsay. Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction, and thank you, Dylan, for set us such a high bar that introduced AI and a basic concept in sort of a, uh, you know, very layman terms to all of us. And uh, I think from Dan's introduction, um, even though I'm in the construction industry where I can see a lot of the fundamental problems are similar, and that is why AI can touch into so many corners and aspects of you know, our work and our lives. My few slides is mostly going to introduce what my research area is focused on, and that's in terms of construction. So there are, you know, I'm sure you've heard this buzzword, digital twin. So digital twin is nothing but a digital replica of what the reality is. And why are we trying to make a replica of what reality is in a digital world? 
because we see benefit in when we gather these information into a digital format that can help us making a better prediction for the future, helping us making a more informed decision and trying to you know, make um, our, for example, construction environment safer. In the remediation cases could be, I know you guys go through a lot of history and documents trying to understand what happened in the past. If we have this digital replica already existing from all the previous stakeholders, right, from construction to operation and maintenance, and when even uh, decommissioning, and when it passed to you, your team, you have all this rich information and data ready, they're integrated, sorted in a nice format, right? I, I often like to use these slides to explain a lot of chunk, a big chunk of work what we do right now is we collect data in a very segmented format. Each company collect their own data in their own software, in their own structure of their spreadsheet. And these are just like these unsorted piles of fruit. We have no idea for each type of fruit, how much there is, are we lacking in which term, how are we gonna predict what's gonna happen in the future. So I think there is a big drive and a big goal from the academic perspective, as well as at the higher point, like when we stand at a higher level, when we look at from industry perspective, we want to create it a more of a, integrated, maybe not data is integrated, but we have a more standardized format when we create, collect data and create these digital twin. That can benefit the entire industry, benefit multiple industries involved in one type of project. So a uh, lot of the work I actually contributed to and my research relied um, relied on was looking into different types of data. We have structured data, data stored in spreadsheet, data stored in database. We have unstructured data like reports. We have unstructured data like survey. We have spatial data. We have temporal data. How are we able to use all different form of data, create this digital twin, this replica of our real world and help us making better decision? This infrastructure risk identification example might speak to you a bit more in terms of it uses the network modeling, it taps more into the geospatial data. So this is one of the projects that I'm currently pursuing. Um, we know when we talk about infrastructure, maybe the first thing pops into your head is, okay, the role network. There's different critical infrastructures, more than just a physical road network. When you think about when there's a big push in adopting electrical vehicle, we have more and more electrical vehicle charging stations coming, you know, popping up everywhere too. So that itself creates a network too. So if we think the electrical vehicle charging station as a new emergent infrastructure, this EV infrastructure is very dependent on multiple layers of infrastructure, for example, road network and our power grid. When you think about in extreme weather condition when a disaster or like a flood comes in, if certain road is flooded and our EV drivers and users can drive, physically drive to an EV charging station to charge their vehicle, they stuck. Or if a certain portion of our power grid goes down. Even the road was not flooded, the EV user still couldn't charge their vehicle. So it makes this emergent infrastructure even more vulnerable. So this research particularly is going to look into how do we identify a risk um, and how we assess different risks at different locations under severe weather condition and help us you know, understanding and providing a more mitigation strategy. And when, you know, when severe weather happens, it's, it's almost like 
the remediation project where you go onto the, the site, you draw bore holes and trying to survey what are the conditions. Similarly, under a disaster, we have these survey reports, but they are pointed data. They are data points. They don't tell us a holistic picture of how exactly the, 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 uh, the impact of the disaster. So where there's, again, machine learning and AI comes in to help us creating a more holistic picture. What exactly are the damage? And built up upon that, we tap into geospatial and social data to understand which portion or which section of the damage create a bigger impact for our community, which has higher prior priority that we want to restore first or prioritize our resource to help this community. So that's basically the nutshell of this project. And I think I'm going to stop here. It's already seven and a half minutes. I will pass it to Dylan. Great. So I'm Dylan Adams. I am a patent attorney at the firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. And in my practice, I help uh, companies of all sizes to protect their ideas and inventions with patents. And in doing so, I have to understand the technology as well, if not better than my clients. And like, unlike a lot of attorneys, I have a technical background. And actually, to be a patent attorney, you're required to have a technical background, which for me includes electroengineering, biochemistry, and molecular biology. Um, and so, you know, I have experience with drafting technical documents related to AI. So I understand AI in that sense, and also uh, kind of in my graduate work as well. So how does AI fit into my practice as a patent attorney? So what I do is I help uh, folks plan patent protection and then also build the patent portfolios. And so it would probably helps to kind of step back and kind of go over the patent process and that will give you a sense of how AI fits into my practice and sort of fits into law in general. So like I said, we draft these very detailed descriptions of how technology is made and used. And sometimes this is going to be upwards of 100 pages or so. It's very detailed descriptions of how the technology is made and used. So we file these applications at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. They wait in line for one to three years before examination begins. And then it begins an examination where the examiner is going to pick up the application and do a prior art search to determine whether what is claimed is new and non-obvious in view of the prior art. So this kind of starts a negotiation, and it's a natural part of the examination process of patents. So you think of it like Pawn Stars or American Pickers, where you're haggling over getting the best price. That's a good analogy with the, uh, the patent process. So the way it works is the examiner is going to formalize the rejections in what is called an office action and, and mail that to us. And then we have about six months to file a response and say, well, you were wrong about this, or maybe we need to amend the application. And then the examiner will probably send us another off section. We have to do another response. This back and forth can go on for sometimes months, sometimes years. So it's a, it's a long process. Okay, so hopefully at some point, the examiner is convinced that what you have is new and non-obvious over the prior art, the application is allowed, and then you pay an issue fee, and then the application grants as a patent. So where, do, where does AI fit into all of this? So one is generating document templ templates. So a good example would be during that examination process, we get that office action. We have really good AI that can scrub the office action, find all the relevant data, and generate templates for us so we don't have to have staff do that or we don't have to do it as attorneys at our absurdly high billing rates. We can just focus on doing the, the highly technical things. Also, just general document generation. So there's a lot of information that needs to be put into forms, and this can be done automatically with good programs that we have. And probably most importantly is in document editing. So for instance, there are a lot of requirements for how you have to specifically format things, how you, ha how you have to word things in terms of patent applications. Um, and, 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 and there's like a lot of laws and a lot of regulations that you have to comply with. We have some great AI programs that we use to scrub these documents and make sure that we're complying with relevant laws and regulations. But also, there's a lot of case law throughout, you know, since the 1800s that says using certain words or certain phrases, saying things in a certain way can be really detrimental to our clients or can actually be really beneficial. And so we have great AI programs as well that we use to scrub our documents to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward for our clients and not using terms that are going to severely limit their patent protection and that are going to be expanding that as much as possible given the relevant case law. So what about the future of 
AI in, in law. So we're at a point now where, and, and you're probably familiar with this, where it's really basic. You know, you're having things like templates that are generated automatically, things where you are scrubbing documents, even basic things like, like, like spell check, an advanced version of those sort of things. But AI is gonna move into doing more of the heavy lifting in generating these documents. So in, in the legal world, so I talked about drafting these office actions or drafting the, the detailed patent applications. I think AI at some point is gonna be doing more of that. It's gonna be starting off where AI and people will work in concert. I will be working with an AI, giving it prompts, tell, you know, telling it what to draft instead of drafting every single sentence myself. And it'll progress to points where it'll get basic prompts and then it'll be able to draft maybe a whole patent application or a whole office action response that then we would you know, go through and we would scrub and make sure that it is, is something that we're okay with. And that's sort of gonna be the, the direction of things. Similar, similar I, I think at some point, AI is going to be able to make live legal arguments. Um, and at the very least is going to be, be able to assist with making live legal arguments. A good example here is, so in that examination process, we will sometimes, we'll call up the examiner, have an interview and say, hey, you're not quite understanding our technology or the, the description that we're using, or maybe you've cited prior art against us and maybe you're not quite understanding that prior art and let's kind of discuss this. I can see where, where, where AI is going to be able to actually make arguments or at least discuss these things with the examiner and in some ways do it better than people are gonna be able to do because the AI is gonna know, it, you know, be able to have access to all of these documents and cite to specific portions um, or at the very least is you know, in initial stages will be able to help us say, hey, you know, the examiner said this, maybe you should, you know, here, here's a talking point or here's a portion of the description, here are some point parts of the drawings that you should reference and use it as something sort of on the back end, you know, the AI isn't actually making uh, points themselves. Also, just sort of with the general admin side of things, we're, we're going to move from having folks, for instance, who are doing a lot of filing, doing a lot of uh, organization of things. We're, we're going to have virtual assistants who are going to be able to help us with those things and really streamline the, the administration process. So how about in uh, civil and uh, environmental engineering? The first two things are very analogous to kind of what I just talked about. So as far as like things like generating reports, Right now, you may have uh, AI that is going to generate templates. You may then move to a process where you're going to be working heavily with AI to generate reports. But long term, AI will be able to pretty much draft these whole reports, which then you will go back and scrub and make sure that uh, it, 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 it's something that you are comfortable with, complies with laws, things like that. Similarly, the business admin, it's going to go in the same direction where we're going to be working with AI collaboratively and at some point where we're going to have virtual assistants who are going to act like secretaries or paralegals, things like that, to be able to uh, do a lot of that, that work that, uh, that, that we need assistance with. Something that you know, is not necessarily analogous to, to law is things like data processing, data modeling, and developing software. AI is really, really good on the software side. Um, I recently saw an article where somebody, they, they scribbled on a napkin an, a, 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 an interface for a website, took a picture of it, and then uh, it was ChatGTP4 Chat was able to build a working website just based off of this snapshot of some scribbles on a cocktail napkin. And this is just the early stages of things. So that's kind of my, my take and my perspective uh, being, uh, being, a, being a patent attorney. Thanks. All right, um, so kick off the Q&A. Um, got a couple general questions for all the panelists. Um, the first is what do you think the future of AI will look like in five years, 10 years, or do we even know? And I thought maybe Dan, you could kick this one off. All right. Uh, considering that most of our audience is already not using ChatGPT, maybe a little bit of context. Um, ChatGPT is a, what they call a large language model. Version 1 was released in June 2018, and it was trained on 117 million parameters. Ver version 2 came in February 2019, and it was a 10x increase. It was trained on 1.5 billion parameters. Version three came out in 2020, June 2020, and that was a 100x increase, and it was trained on 175 billion parameters. Version four came out in March 2023, and the company no longer publishes these numbers, because obviously they're getting scary. 
is my theory. So going back to this uh, paper folding, it turns out that most people can fold a sheet of paper beyond seven times because the thickness grows exponentially. Our brains think linearly, but technology advances exponentially. So if I start folding this piece of paper on every birthday, by my fifth birthday, I have 32, it's probably, it's going to be 32 sheets thick. By the 10th birthday, it's going to be a thousand sheets thick, which is two rims of paper, about the width of your hand. And by the time you get to your 30th birthday, the width exceeds the width of the universe. That's how quickly um, things progress. So um, the difference between five years and 10 years is not a linear increment. It's, it's an exponential increment that is hard for us to imagine. If you think about 10 years ago, there are a lot of things we take for granted now that did not exist at all. So it's very hard to predict what will happen in five years. One thing we can be sure of is that in five years, AI is going to be ubiquitous everywhere. Later this year, Microsoft is going to um, integrate OpenAI's um, GPT-4 model into Office 365, which means it's going to be everywhere. Microsoft Word, you're going to be able to just give it a notes and tell it to look at a complete report, and it will generate a report using the notes that looks like the complete report that you have. You're, you're going to be able to join a, a Teams call and get a summary of everything that happened before you joined. And at the end of the call, Teams is going to be able to send out action items just by itself from listening to the call. And um, Excel is going to have a whole new set of superpowers as well. You're going to be able to just take a, a sketch of notes and give it to PowerPoint and it will generate a presentation ready slide deck. And this is just GPT-4. And at the rate at which we're innovating, we don't even know what will happen next year, let alone in five years. But again, in, in five years, we know that ethical concerns will be at the forefront of these discussions. Because we want AI to be fair, we want the biases to be removed out of it, and we want it to benefit everyone. If I have to guess what will happen in 10 years, the AI models we have now are very brute force. They require a lot of compute power to train. I think in 10 years, we'll have AI that is smarter. ChatGPT is surprisingly terrible at common sense actions. So in a recent TED talk, somebody asked, uh, the presenter asked ChatGPT, Chat I'm riding a bicycle on a bridge that um, is suspended over nails. Am I going to get a puncture? And ChatGPT said yes. <laughs> it, the same presenter asked ChatGPT, I have a 12 quart jug and a six quart jug, and I want to measure six quarts. How do I do it? ChatGPT proceeded to give an elaborate series of steps. Instead of just saying, well, you already have a six quart jug, use it. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't figured out common sense yet. In the next 10 years, I think we're going to get closer to that. The other thing AI is terrible at today is it doesn't know when it's wrong. The answers we get are not precise and it doesn't give you a measure of how unprecise the answers are. So in the next 10 years, in addition to getting an answer, we might also get a degree of certainty with that answer. And, and using prompt engineering, we're able to mitigate all of these today. So for instance, as a programmer, when I ask ChatGPT to generate code, I, I, I create two AI agents. One generates the code and the other critiques the AI that is generating the code and they go back and forth till they, they agree and give me code that I'm more confident in. So using prompt engineering right now, we're sort of mitigating, but in the next 10 years, we may no longer have to do that.
The other thing that might happen in the next 10 years is we'll have um, autonomous um, agents. So self-driving might be a thing. And um, we'll have robots that are able to do things on your own. We'll have IoT devices, this Internet of Things devices, like auto samplers in the field that are sampling, digging up dirt, taking samples, analyzing the samples, and sending information back to the cloud. So anyway, in either case, I think it's going to be an interesting future. Yeah, so you know, I, I would say, I, I, I think Dan is right on, and some of that may sound a bit scary and a bit like, how is that gonna even be possible, right? But it, my, my, my prediction would be in five years, I, I think Dan is right on, that AI is gonna be ubiquitous in our everyday lives, in our working lives, uh, especially that we're, begin, we're gonna be working with AI as, as an assistant in a lot of ways. It's gonna be collaboration in, in, in making things. And I would say in 10 years, I wouldn't be surprised if we are close to, if not at human level intelligence with AI. Um, and, and that's really going to change the landscape. I mean, it, we're going to have virtual agents. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm maybe not quite as uh, confident about having robotics. Robotics tends to uh, move linearly, whereas the AI that powers robotics and just general AI, th that is going to progress exponentially. I have a lot of robotic clients, and that stuff is, is still kind of behind as far as like the, the hardware goes. There's going to be a lot of progressions in 10 years. But what will progress is that you will have these virtual agents that will be, you know, I think very close to, if not at human level of intelligence. That's, that's my prediction. So I want to move on to what your thoughts are on professional ethics um, for using AI on public projects in particular and kind of limitations. I think, Lindsay, you touched a little bit on some limitations with data sets being siloed within our industry. So I thought maybe you could start with this question. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. I think, from a professional engineer's perspective, we, we took an oath and we swore to protect the public. And, and, and I remember this phrase exactly from the, the practice or professionalism of engineer that says we hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public and have regard to for the environment and we have to protect the public. So in terms of using AI, before a human being, an engineer can fully understand where did the AI, or where the result came from, fully understand the, the process, or we are able to using our intelligence to derive the same answer or a similar answer, we are just not able, we, we just can't fully 100% accept whatever AI prompts to us because this, th there is a very high stake. If we make a mistake, there might be very severe consequence to the public, to the general public. So I think from the perspective of a, a professional and being a professional in this industry, we have a, a different responsibility in terms of how can we use AI. Yes, we've already seen the power of using AI. How can we create a better, more transparent AI algorithm? How can we assist computer, computer science engineers to better harness the power of AI? I think that is a more critical or the challenge we face right now. Um, and I don't see we can 100% trust AI at this point, or probably not in five years either. What do you think, Dan or Dylan? Yeah, I, I, I agree. When I think of ethics, um, three things come to mind, transparency, fairness and accountability. Uh, if you're going to use AI on your, on your projects, I think all stakeholders need to know that you're using AI. And, and this is not even just all being altruistic. The fact is some of the work products of the AI cannot be modified in very specific ways because they are probabilistic um, outputs. 
So if you use AI to generate an image and, and the client comes back and says, change the, the shirt color from green to, to blue, it's not something that you're going to be able to do easily because the AI will regenerate a whole new image that might look sufficiently different. And at that point, you'll have to come out and say, I can't do it because I used AI the first time. So just being transparent of the bad is beneficial. And also being transparent about the data that was used to train the AI. These big tech companies just use the fact that somebody put their work on the internet as free license to train AI. And, and we're even now cloning musicians' voices and, and producing songs using those voices without attribution and without um, any of the benefits accruing to those original sources. So in that way, it's not very fair and, and using it on public projects presents an ethical dilemma. And also, um, when the public pays for projects and the de derivative deliverables get used to train AI for profit, that also presents a kind of a conflict of interest. And then there's the issue of accountability. If I, as an engineer, rely heavily on AI and something goes wrong with that work product, you know, who do I point to? Where does the chain of responsibility end? With me, my firm, with the company that trained the, the AI, or with the data. So recently, uh, a Tesla vehicle crashed right into a barrier on the road. And when they did the investigation it, using uh, Google Street Maps, the images that it was trained on, it turned out the barrier was not there at the time that it was trained. So, you know, yeah. So using AI ethically, I think, will have to be transparent, fair, and know where the chain of responsibility ends. Yeah, what, one thing I'll add to that is sort of the optics side of it in, in the sense that you need to consider the way the public is going to take your use of AI and if, if they find out of that. So a good example is there's been a lot of backlash with folks who are generating content. Like for instance, there was a guy who created a children's book using ChatGPT and using, I think it was Dolly or maybe Midjourney to create the images. And it was a really successful book and he came out and said, yeah, I created this using AI. And there was a huge backlash and then people were boycotting it. And so understand that there are gonna be a lot of people who are gonna be really against using AI, especially these generative AI, like as far as images or with, um, you know, with, with audio. If you are doing something that is taking away the jobs of artists, there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna see that as being a negative thing. And so consider those impacts that you may be really efficient in generating content but there may be people who may demonize you and what you've done by doing that. So that, that's, especially in early days and early adoption, there, there, there are gonna be, be people on both sides of things, people who love it and people who hate it. So consider those optics when, when using AI on projects. Thank you. Given um, the rapid developments in AI, as Dan has illustrated by the paper folding conceptual exercise, I know it can be a little bit overwhelming to think that this will be integrated into our daily work whether you pr pursue it or not in the next five years. Um, how can you utilize AI, harness AI, and work together um, in our industry to be able to, to not be overwhelmed by it and then also get, a, get ahead of ourselves from a risk management perspective? And I know one thing on a lot of our minds is usually data privacy kind of falls into that. And you know, AI is gonna be ubiquitous in you know, cloud storage, word processing, spreadsheet software. It's gonna be hard to avoid having it, you know, anything you put into AI become part of the neural network. I'm gonna open the floor to whoever wants to take that one. <laughs> Maybe I'll start and, and others can chime in. Uh, and a point of correction on my folding, uh, the 30 folds gets you to the edge of space. It's 100 folds that gets you outside the width of the, the universe. Uh, so AI, it's folding at 100 times now, not, not two, right? So things are advancing really rapidly. And uh, if you want to harness AI, you have to be aware of the risks. So I think the first thing a firm needs to do is to have guidelines in place. Assemble a team, have guidelines in place for risk management. Um, there are covert channels that leak information based on what your people are, are inputting into the AI. The second thing you want to do is to be transparent. Be transparent in how you're using AI to manage your staff, 
Because like I said, uh, when Microsoft integrates uh, GPT into all the Office products, there are HR implications as well. You know, every email is it's analyzed, right? And it's giving you sentiment analysis on that. And all of that can be seen at a corporate level. So be transparent how you're using AI to manage your staff and how you're using AI to manage your work products. And also be transparent to your stakeholders um, in terms of what you're using AI to produce. And then um, every organization should also have a steering committee that is looking at the trends that are coming. Some of these trends, if you jump on them too late, you're probably not going to get the, the benefits as much if you're a late adopter, because you know, your reputation will be so far behind that you may never catch up. Um, the, the other thing you want to do is uh, use it for high impact tasks and start small. Start with a small pilot project and scale accordingly so you can properly assess the risk in the specific domain that you're using it for. And then finally, you will need to invest in training. In the old days, I had colleagues that were very good at Googling. And now all of that, those skills are, have evolved. We're all going to have to get very good at uh, prompt engineering. Being able to ask AI a question in a way that allows it to give you uh, a precise answer with some degree of certainty. So investing in training will be key. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll add something to it as well. So, uh, you know, and, and this kind of goes back to a qu the question we kind of skipped over is how, you know, how are firms differentiated who are going to use AI, who, who, who aren't going to use AI? So it's kind of like asking, well, what about firms that still hand draw things and don't use uh, computer aided drawing or firms that don't use email or don't use word processing like, like Word? Well, that doesn't exist now, right? So firms will not survive if they're not able to incorporate AI into what they're doing. It's just, it's going to be something that people have to adapt to. The question then is, how do we do that? Okay, and we, I, maybe show of hands again, who's, who's used Chat, chat GPT or Mid Journey or anything like that. Anybody? Okay, good. So, and I think that that's that's one of the things that's really important. And Dan sort of touched on this: is the way to make sure that you're not left behind is by learning how AI works and how you interact with that. How do you generate prompts? How how can you em employ even these early generation products into your workflow and in the workflow of the people that you work with? Um, you have to understand. Generation one, which is really early and really basic. I mean, think about like this is like Netscape Navigator and early days of AOL and CompuServe and Alta Vista. If you happen to remember those sort of early early days things, don't you know? You don't want to be the people who are the, who, who don't understand how to do these basic things because you know Generation two is going to be built on Generation one and so on and so on. And if it becomes a work mandated thing where you have to start using this and you're coming in at Generation six and you don't understand how generation one, two, three, four, and five work, you're gonna be way, way behind. So my challenge to you would be go home and play with ChatGPT if you haven't already, go play with something like Dolly, figure out what these things are, learn how to do prompts. It's actually really fun and enjoyable. It's not you know, like, like some things where it's like, why would I wanna do this, this is dumb. It's actually really fun. So learn how to use the interface so that you're not going to be left behind long term. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I don't have more to add. I okay. think I think I covered really well and really is to don't need to feel there. There's really no need to feel um, too overwhelmed by the technology. I think enjoy it. It's out. Try it. Have fun with it. And you will discover it's not as smart as you thought. <laughs> <laughs> So our jobs aren't going away. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Does anyone have any questions for the panel in the back? Do you think that at some point they'll be so advanced that we might even have to have these conferences? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah. I'm not on the panel, but I think connecting with people in person, I think as we've learned coming out of the pandemic, is very important. Yes. So. Yeah, I, I think that's a yeah. really good point is that, you know, that's one thing that AI, for, at least for a long, long time, is not going to be able to reproduce is 
human interaction. We, we are really good at being human and interacting with, 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 with each other, and AI is, is, is definitely not there yet. So I don't think that AI is going to replace, replace those human connections. Anything that you do that is, that is directly client-facing, that, that is networking with, with, with your colleagues and, and, and your customers, folks like that, those are going to be some of the last things that AI is going to replace. And I, and I, I kind of want to add, too, is that don't be afraid of AI replacing you. AI is only going to replace the people who don't use it to augment what they're doing. I, again, kind of, kind of go back to the analogy of using Microsoft Word and spell check and you know, computer-aided drawing. It, it, AI is not something to be afraid of. It's going to be a colleague for a long time. It probably will re re replace us at some point, but don't worry about that. Worry about it being a colleague and learn about how to learn how to, how to work with it effectively. Oh, and if I may just add, I, uh, I hope it gets so good that all we do is attend conferences. So for instance, uh, <laughs> if I had AI working for me, I wouldn't have to leave this conference early today. We could just hang out here and talk, right? And, and still have work done. Did you have a question in the front? Yeah. Um, the social media, it seems like now society is getting more and more divisive because of the algorithms that we didn't know about. And in doing so, it started basically separating us to being you know, either this part of the, of, the, of the crowd or that part of the crowd. And now I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that um, you know, the, the AI can disguise. And in doing so, you can see a video of yourself giving a presentation about child porn, yes. which you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, there's a voice and a, and a, a a picture of you talking as it stands, so therefore, you know, you are you are are being subjected to it. So I'm just wondering how do you protect yourself from the evil AI? Because it's gonna come. I mean it's 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 it, there's bad characters out there. How are you going to prevent that from happening? Or is this just gonna happen? Maybe I'll, I'll start again, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, so I think it's like a lot of these things. People need to build up a natural immune system when it comes to being online. And I think that in a lot of ways people have been lazy. That That's one of the issues that we see right now is that people look at Facebook and they see headlines and they assume it, that it's like, well, this is, this is totally legitimate. This is fine. I'm going to believe in this. And it causes an echo chamber and all that kind of stuff. People need to get better at critical thinking. And maybe AI is going to help us with that. That now we're going to make the assumption, well, this, this video, I can't assume that this is right. This text, I can't assume that it's right. I need to be better about learning where this comes from, what the sources are, instead of just taking it at face value. So maybe AI will actually help us because we're gonna have to think a lot more critically and not just trust in the headlines that we see and trust in the text, but you're exactly right. These things are really scary. The deep fakes that you talk about where you can have somebody who looks photo or video realistic, saying whatever, um, it's, it, that, it, it's really concerning. And this, the, the unfortunate thing is there's no easy answer to it. There are good programs now that can find, you know, that, that sort of analyze those things and can deter, determine whether they're a deep fake or not. That's going to become harder and harder to do. And it's not something that individuals can do. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's something that is really concerning. Um, for, for society is we're not going to be able to tell what reality is and, and, and what it's not long term. I think I want to add a little bit on Dylan's answer. I think as general public, we need to give more pressure to these big giant tech companies because what the powers we see, these very powerful AIs are developed by these big pockets they have they have a deep pocket of money and they are not driven by using ai for good they are driven by profits they want to make profit that ultimately leads to algorithm that discard um, some aspect to differentiate or to cite the source of the origins but are just pushing the content to these reinforcing what a person already know. So that is further dividing the audience or the opinion. Mm -hmm. So there, I think there are a big drive from, at least from academia, from us, 
we are driven by AI for good, AI for society. But we are very limited in terms of the funding sources we get. And then our voice is generally not as high as those commercial, you know, giant tech companies. Uh, I think, as Dylan said, with more of more like people like you getting into understand, starting to inter interact with AI, you will see more and more these problems showing up and together we can make a better decision. We can pressure on these tech company for them to make changes. And I will add um, a little bit to what Dylan and Lindsay said. Um, every technology comes with its own safety, safety rules eventually. So when cars were first invented, you, you had to have a person walking in front of the car, signaling to the horses so that everybody would be safe. And when airplanes were first invented, they were notoriously unsafe. But now, flying is one of the safest uh, modalities of travel. So I think eventually, if what Ling Zi just said happens, there'll be enough of an outcry that safety concerns will be considered. And, and AI will be developed to make AI behave and make AI safe. After all, all the safety features in your car are now part of the car. And the safety features of the internet, like the antiviruses, the rating system where um, I rate a place when I go, that's kind of a safety feature, right? Comments, moderators, all of that are now part of the internet. So I think we're going to advance to a point where AI safety features will be part of the AI, as voices like these are amplified. I saw a few hands in the back <laughs> earlier. Do you uh, what kind of regulations are on the horizon? What kind of regulations are on the horizon, if you didn't hear that? Any? I'm at all? Looking at, I'm looking at Dublin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> looking at the lawyer. And so from a, from a law perspective, the law is totally unequipped to deal with these things. Uh, and and it, it is the wild west right now. I, I can give a bit of an anecdote as far as you know, patent stuff goes. So AI is doing amazing stuff, and I have a YouTube video that kind of talks about some interactions I've had with some AI about this, where it's at a level now where if I, I would have to name it by law as an inventor in a patent application, but the law says right now it has to be a human person, but there are some foreign jurisdictions that are saying now that AIs can be potentially named as inventors on patent applications. So, you know, the, the law is going to be totally in flux. It's going to be weird. And it's based on stuff, you know, stuff from the 1800s and it's supposed to be applied to AI. So I would say, you know, who knows what's going to happen with regulation? It's, it's really up in the air. The lawyers are always late. They're not helping. <laughs> well, and the lawmakers too. I mean, you look at who the lawmakers are. They don't even understand the basis of how the internet works. How are they supposed to create laws that regulate AI when they don't understand just the basics of websites and 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 how software works? You know, that's going to be a major issue. It's it's the people who are who are leaders who are way way behind who aren't going to be able to create laws. Um, you know, so it, it's going to be slow going and it's going to be strange. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> um, um, so I, I just foresee um, some pretty uh, in the near future. We can uh, do like document editing, like um, or document generating uh, using AI. But how soon you think uh, we can use AI to produce reliable results of like technical um, applications such as like generating a size conceptual model or like analyzing? And is there a way to, to, to check, like for example, like um, Dan said, if we, we want to use um, AI generated image every time it be different, and like we do, this is like a black box. We like say, hey, AI generate a ground one model, but decide every time different. And how can we double check, and how can we trust AI? Like how soon you think um, the AI will produce reliable? Uh, how can we? How soon we think we can use it in our technical world? Uh, maybe I'll take that one real quick. I actually like the variability in our models, right? I think we just need to be honest about variability. So even now we do Monte Carlo analysis where we report vari variability, right? Um, 
in surface water modeling, the data sets that we're using are not that precise. So uh, we, we report our numbers in ranges and we have error bars. And so I actually think that variability is a feature. If you're mapping a plume, you're not going to know um, to a high degree of confidence that the plume really exists where you say you are because you only have a few uh, borings um, that you're extrapolating from. So keeping the variability and reporting it, I think it's already a feature. I think AI and machine learning models now are, are very good at um, developing site models and capturing that variability. They just need to get better at reporting it more. So do you foresee like different products in the future we need to like learn how to use it or this is going to be a, like a generalized um, product like for example for chatting you need like a text-based prompt and um, well, we know if you want to edit a document or um, you know text-based AI to give you things like something like Microsoft uh, <laughs> for that uh, incorporating, uh, you know, open, what's called, GPT-4, GPT, any other future generation. Is there going to be a, in the future, it's going to be like some one doc, uh, one product or just a few less than five doc, uh, uh, application or we have to learn out, out of like, uh, like 100. <laughs> 100 applications, you have to know how to use each of them, or like, uh, and compete in each product, or it's just going to be like less than five, and you can choose one. Because we already have, like, for example, go to Apple Store, App Store is like 100, I don't know, millions of products, so you don't know which one is better. So, you know, do you foresee it's going to be just a small pool, I don't know, like small pool of product you can kind of just choose or just I think uh, I think it will be even easier than that. So, if you realize ChatGPT has no help documents, no instructions. When you go there, it's just one text box for your input. You only have one choice. So, what the iPhone did was it made a human interface with software so intuitive that subsequent products are having to compete. So, um, AI is going to make things so easy, so intuitive that there will be almost no learning required. The engineers, on the other hand, behind the scenes will have to be trained, you know, in order to use it. But the, the general public will, will need very simple products. And we're actually even moving away from the devices, you know. With human action recognition, you're, you're going to be able to prompt it with just gestures or, or images, you know. So yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be very simple. So simple, my grandmother in Africa can use it. <laughs> One thing I think you'll see too is like a lot of these, like a lot of these cycles, like think about the early days of the internet when we had the internet boom, where like pets.com and all that kind of stuff, where anything with a dot-com, you know, these were billion dollar companies and everybody was investing in. I think we're gonna see an AI boom and it's gonna be kind of more like an AI bubble for a while. So for a while, I think you're gonna see tons of products. Everybody's going to have their AI products and it's going to seem, you know, crazy and then it's going to get whittled down to the ones that actually work. The bubble will kind of burst and it'll kind of be where we are now, you know, where companies have survived and there's been this competition and then there's going to be the dominant product. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to go through a phase where you're just going to be inundated. It's going to be AI everything and everybody has their AI product and look at how sexy my AI product is. And just, you know, we'll get through that. The market need, will need to settle, will need to kind of burst that bubble and then it'll become kind of more normal and you'll have your core companies that will survive that. We're past time, but if there's interest, I think the, the um, person in the back, did you want to ask your question too? Well, I think some of it's covered by the okay. people, but I, touching on that, because there are so many apps that are chat team based, do you, re do you recommend a particular one over some of the others? Because there are so many. Well, it depends on whether you want to pay or don't want to pay, and whether, <laughs> and whether you want to support open source and the academics or not, you know, so it's a little nuanced. And like Dylan said, the field is crowded right now. But um, 
Thankfully, when Microsoft intri um, integrates ChatGPT into all of Office products, you're going to be able to get most of that for free. ChatGPT has already been integrated with Bing Search. So, you know, you can just use that and get a lot. Uh, U.com is a, uh, a free open source alternative that gives you search and uh, generative AI all in one, you know. So, again, I think it depends. <laughs> And it kind of depends on what you're looking to do. Are you looking to generate images or are you looking to generate text? I think it can be good to go back to the source. Like, you know, start with chat GPT-3. You know, that, 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 that's a good place to start. A lot of times, uh, a lot of these companies are building off, the, uh, off that API and they're adding functionality to it. Um, it. But it depends on what you're looking to do. You know, if you're looking to generate images, things like Midjourney or Dolly, those are really fun ones. You know, or even just put, put in a search of like, you know, top free, you know, AI image generators. Um, I think starting with something, with something free is a great place to start. Figure out what you're looking to do and then decide if, it, if it's worthwhile to pay for things. But you're right. You're going to see tons. Everybody's going to have their AI apps and it's going to be hard to differentiate where to, where to start. That's kind of related to the question I had. It's like, you know, for data sets, like, is there a good place to go? You mentioned Microsoft's going to be integrating their Excel. It sounds like it hasn't quite happened, but I'm just because I was looking at my spreadsheet last night going, what am I going to pull out of this? Like, it would be great to know if there's a tool I can go to right now to put that spreadsheet into or have to wait for a little longer to find yourself out of that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the current version of Excel already has some AI capabilities built in where it will, on the side, it will try to give you some plots that you might want to try. But it's about to get way better. Well, this looks like it. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick add-on. Is there any concerns with the product or like the, the database, whatever you're putting in, going into the open source and privacy? Like, how do you manage that? It it is a big concern. With ChatGPT, Microsoft owns the data and they can use anything you put in ChatGPT according to their policy. And this is a big, um, you know, from academia perspective, we criticize them. We've been, you know, voicing our concerns for, for a while that one is regarding their data policy. And the reason that ChatGPT is is growing so fast is because millions and billions of users like us, right, <laughs> putting in these free data for them. And one of, one of the challenging in we want to harness the power of AI in terms of civil and environmental engineering in these technical fields is we just simply don't have the database, that data set that's shared by every company that can be used to support fine tuning the parameter. And then I think another other aspect of ChatGPT um, is the, yes, it is seemingly very powerful, but it's also gigantic. It has billions, hundreds of billions of parameters that is beyond any regular company could possibly, you know, be able to train a model with that such huge parameters. So I think there's also a push to simplify the model while not losing much of the power of AI. So um, in short, right now, if you're using ChatGPT, I my suggestion is don't put in any sensitive data in. Yeah. And actually, I okay. have a gripe with that. So Melissa yeah. here is our branch manager for <laughs> Pacific Northwest. And this new computer that they gave me, uh, uh, my, you know how you have your My Documents folder that's supposed to be on the computer? Now it's in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So like any document that I say, Microsoft automatically has access to, and who knows what you're doing with it. So for this reason, I, I walk around carrying three computers. I have the work computer, and then I have my own Mac. <laughs> you know, try to protect my data from getting out. We there. can give you an old computer back if you want. <laughs> I can say from a legal perspective, so for instance, our firm, data privacy is huge for our clients. I mean, we deal with, you know, 
billion dollar deals and you know fortune 100 companies and they really really care about data privacy as a result you know we we are not allowed to use chat gpt for anything especially things that are client sensitive because it's even in their explicit terms of service like this will be stored on our databases it could be used as training data so that maybe even it's, it's not that exact thing but that could be spat out somebody in, in response to a prompt so data privacy is is a really huge concern with these things and law firms and, and anybody dealing with sensitive data needs to know that anything you put in there, that could potentially not be, be proprietary data that's protected. You could lose trade secrets. You could potentially be forfeiting patent rights. Again, the law is really new on this. You know, nobody has dealt with that issue yet. But just assume anything you put into those prompts, especially you know things like ChatGPT, where it is going to their database, it is stored there. Assume that it is not going to be private. Even encrypted data, it's, it's not private. There are there is an arms race now where countries are downloading and storing encrypted data because they know in the next five years they'll be able to decrypt it. Anything you've ever put on the internet is probably being used to train somebody's. Um, AI model somewhere, so yeah, that ship has already sailed, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was a little off on time. Uh, we do have time for one more. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, I was hoping you can kind of give like, an example of how you can evaluate bias in AI models, because you know, kind of as we talked about, I think what's really important in our field is like not, much, not so much the data that we have, but the data that we don't have, right? And so if we're only using existing data to train AI, then I think the worry is that you know we might introduce bias in those systems. Um, so if, if, if maybe if there's an example of how you could you know evaluate what you're not getting out of an AI model. Yeah, maybe I can take that one real quick and without trying to get too technical, you're probably familiar with adversarial neural networks, right? What? Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so it's, it's still using uh, AI. You have one neural network that is trying to predict the data and another neural network that is trying to trick it to get it to, to increase its error. And by having an adversarial neural network sort of supervising or criticizing this other neural network that is doing your predictions, you can see where the, um, the neural network is making predictions outside of the data that it was trained on, or it's making predictions in an area of the data that it's got sparse information on, or it's just hallucinating. Because in the solution space, sometimes you have local minimums that uh, the model can get stuck in and think it's found an optimal solution. Whereas if it just zoomed out a little bit, there are better solutions elsewhere. So the adversarial neural network will, will, will change the starting points randomly and compare the answers and then um, compute a bias. But you, you sort of have to understand how the neural networks work and customize them in order to sort of get the, this kind of robustness. If you're using an off-the-shelf product, you may not necessarily, yeah, get that level of robustness. So that's but not available right now, just in the public marketplace, right? Yeah, yeah. but the research is there. We know how, how to do it. Um, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for, for a lay person, I'll say, um, when you ask ChatGPT for something, ask it to critique the answer. That's sort of creating your own adversarial, using ChatGPT as an adversarial agent against itself so that you get some idea of how certain it is about the answer. Um, I actually want to add a little bit just from the perspective of human being. We're talking about human now, not talking about AI. Each of us also have bias. We all of us have unconscious bias. When you think about who created the data, we created data. If the data comes with bias, that's because the creator have bias. So sometimes it's very hard to say how we can predict a bias from a model that trained based on the biased data that was created by the biased people. So I think maybe we should all open our mind a little bit more and be more conscious about the, the unconscious bias we all have. 
Yeah, I think that's really important, to, just to understand that AI will have bias inherently. And a lot of com it comes from the data sets that it's trained on. There's a great example where people are looking at the models now and they're saying it's very English-centric because, because most of the internet is in <laughs> English, right? It has a natural inherent bias towards English and especially, you know, you know, you know kind of like white people, you know, it's, it, it can be very racist in a lot of ways. And so because there's a huge corpus of data that is, you know, highly, you know, that there's more of it in a certain area, that's going to inherently create bias. So the way to get rid of bias is to have more diverse data sets. And there have been big pushes to that, especially people, you know, with, with, with different language saying, look, we need to create more data and put it out there so that when AI, AIs are being trained, it's learning how to work with our language or work, work to work with our culture. So it comes from a data set perspective that you have to have diverse data sets. If you don't have diverse data sets, they are going to be racist and they are going to be biased if they don't have those, those, those diversities. Oh, and I'll just add to that real quick and say that there is actually a profit motive for make, making the AI, training the AI on diverse data. So for instance, simply by teaching a language model how to code, it gets better at non-coding tasks. So you have all these emergent properties that do not emerge unless it sees biased data. By asking Chad, uh, GPT, one of the chat GPT versions to translate uh, a Hindi uh, or a Bengali uh, statement, it did that a couple of times and taught itself all of the language. So, um, which is good for the company that, that is making money off of it too, so. All right, well, we are out of time. Um, thank you all for coming to this session and thank you to our panelists for being here and giving their perspective. Um, I think they're all st sticking around for just a little bit, so if you have more questions, come on up here. Yeah, thank you.